Is Iran testing America's resolve in the Middle East? And what can the Trump administration do in response? Is there a threat of war on the horizon? And what can America do to deal with cyber attacks from China? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellek. Today we sit down with Texas Congressman Van Taylor, who is a former Marine intelligence officer and Iraq War veteran. We discuss new threats to America, Iran, China, as well as Taylor's work on the Entrepreneurship Caucus and what he believes it takes to be bipartisan in today's political climate. Congressman Van Taylor, yeah. wonderful to have you on American Thought Leaders. Great to be with you. Great to be with you. So you are actually uh, in military intelligence, right? And you've also done a tour in Iraq. Um, yeah. No, and I mean, you know, clearly those experiences are important experiences, particularly given some of the world world problems we face today. Uh, was proud to serve in the U.S. Marine Corps, uh, put about 10 years in, uh, and uh, was on active duty as a reconnaissance platoon commander and an intelligence officer. Uh, for an artillery battalion, and then was in a Marine Reserve unit, uh, and we were activated in 2003, and actually led the very first platoon into Iraq on D-Day, uh, March 21st, 2003, uh, into Iraq. Well, they put the reservists out front because they know we'll do a good job. And uh, uh, no, but was proud to serve, uh, and uh, was very, very fortunate not only to accomplish every mission, but to bring every single man home to their families. Incredible. And so let's jump into the topic of the day, Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that's on a lot of people's minds. Um, uh, the Iran deal is over, as, as we know. And, uh, you know, there's actually uh, rockets landing near the U.S. embassy in Baghdad. Um, the Iranian regime is criticizing the U.S., saying it's not going to be bullied. Where do things stand on Iran? Sure. So Iran, for the last 30 years, has attempted to be the regional hegemon. They've tried to you know, take over the region, and they're doing that with military force. Uh, so in my own time, I served in Iraq in 2003. Uh, we actually watched Iranian spies infiltrating from Iran into Iraq, trying to cause and you know riots uh, and to with money and weapons. And I mean, they were you know, and they uh, were responsible for the death of hundreds of Americans by providing uh, ordnance to Shia militias. Right. They're still uh, providing support to Shia militias uh, in Iraq today. Uh, they're, support, they're providing support to rebels in Yemen today. Uh, they are supporting uh, the Assad regime uh, in Syria, which has used chemical munitions against their own people today. Uh, they are supporting Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, which, is, which are forces right. oriented at the destruction of Israel today. Uh, so Iran clearly is an aggressive uh, power attempting to project its military forces, um, you know, by supporting lots of different, you know, terrorist and revolutionary groups uh, around the region. Um, and I think what you've seen here recently with Iran is they're attempting to test America's resolve. Uh, they they thought maybe the Americans aren't serious about defending their allies in the area. Uh, let's conduct some attacks. Uh, let's go after some American forces, maybe go after some foreign forces. It, it appears that they, uh, it is possible that they were behind attack on four different uh, oil tankers. Right. Uh, not U.S. flag tankers, but, f but flagged by other countries. And, and in conducting those attacks, they're, they're trying to see how we responded. They wanted to see, are we committed to the area? Uh, I think the Trump administration did the right thing uh, to send substantial forces and to start making plans to put more substantial forces in the area. And I think that demonstrates America's resolve to keeping Iran's uh, um, expansionist hopes uh, in check. Do you think there's a threat of war here on the horizon? Uh, I certainly hope not. Um, I, I think I'll take you back to uh, a lesson from the 90s uh, when Saddam Hussein actually did a, a buildup of forces uh, in the early 90s and then again in 1998, uh, where he put forces in place. Uh, it looked to us, to the Americans, as though, oh, wow, he's about to invade Kuwait again, uh, which he had successfully done uh, in August of 1990. Um, and so, you know, but the Americans put forces on the ground uh, in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, which basically told Saddam Hussein, look, we're, we're going to take you seriously. Uh, and he, and he, he withdrew. He, he backed his forces up. He pulled them back. Uh, he did not end up invading Kuwait a second time. Uh, now, he continued to do aggressive actions that would unquestionably be called uh, acts of war against the United States uh, for the entire period of time between the ceasefire in 1991 and the time that he was uh, deposed in 2003. So Iran has also um, been talking that, about the fact that it's speeding up its uh, uranium enrichment procedures and 
ahead of what would have been expected under the Iran deal. Do you think this is an issue? Yeah, it's certainly disconcerting, not because uh, there, there is sort of the hope that, well, gee, Iran's just getting nuclear weapons to stop the United States or someone from invading them. Um, but I think what's, what's more worrisome is that they've talked about using those nuclear weapons offensively, uh, specifically against Israel, but you could also see them using that in other places, given the fact they're involved in so many places militarily uh, conducting you know, fights on the ground. Uh, so having them as a nuclear power is definitely a worry. Uh, they would certainly be uh, the least stable, most projectionist, most aggressive. Uh, you know, they're, they're the largest state sponsor of terror in the world. I mean, they're, they're definitely someone to be worried about. And a state sponsor of terror in possession of nuclear weapons is, is of great concern, I think, to every, every American and every person around the world. The, a number of convincing analyses I've seen say is Israel will never let that happen. Well, uh, we'll see about that. I mean, I, I, but I, I, I just, it is something to be worried about and something that I certainly am concerned about. A big issue for you in Texas actually has been the issue of cybersecurity. Right. And uh, this is actually a huge issue when it comes to um, you know, the China trade war, as, mm -hmm. as we're describing it. Um, tell me a little bit about how you see uh, American, the American situation for cybersecurity. Sure. Well, stepping back just a little bit, you know, the, you know, the U.S. economy is is doing incredibly well. Uh, you literally have 1.3 million more job openings than you have unemployed people in America, and that is going to require more and more automation and automation of in the manufacturing space, but also in the services space with using computers. And the more you put online, the more you're going to have worries about protecting the information that is online. So that goes to your question of cybersecurity. Uh, I'm very proud of my district, uh, the third district of Texas, which uh, includes Plano and Frisco and Allen and McKinney. And in those cities, there's some really amazing cybersecurity companies and firms uh, that are really on the front lines of trying to protect uh, their clients, their customers, uh, and their own data uh, from cyber attacks. And so that's something that's, that's a very real, um, there, there are economic damages around that. Uh, and so there, this is something that certainly I'm focused on. And I, I literally hear about every day when I talk to companies back home uh, because it's, it's what they do. Apparently, uh, you know, a lot of companies weren't even reporting things because they were afraid that share prices, you know, would be hurt or they would they would look bad. But apparently, in a lot of ways, for a number of years, America was kind of wide open to this behavior. Um, well, I think look, you're certainly watching uh, a, a, a nascent. It doesn't. You, you think the internet is fully developed and there's everything there that's going to be there, but I think it's still it's still emerging. I think you're still watching the capabilities of the internet uh, be created and formulated. And I think you're going to watch again. I think you're going to see tremendous investment in automation, uh, in processes, and I think you're going to see more effort towards cybersecurity. And we had a hearing yesterday in the Homeland Security Committee right. talking about how do we get more people? How do we get more staff? And you know, one of the discussion points was, look, uh, not everybody is a college degree cybersecurity professional. Some of these people are going to be with maybe some programming classes in high school, and they're going to go in in cybersecurity. Maybe they're going to get an associate's degree and then be in cybersecurity. Maybe they're going to be a PhD and get in cybersecurity. And maybe they start at one for two years, and then they do the associate's degree for two years, and then they go back and they work for five years, and then they get a, got, uh, a bachelor's degree. And so um, you're going to see a workforce that's going to need to develop and evolve uh, as we continue to create a, a strong workforce that can handle the cybersecurity requirements of tomorrow. And, and they're very demanding. There's no question about that. So I, I guess one question, based on what you know in, the, in this field, you know. Um, do you expect that uh, the Chinese side would live up to the expectation that they would stop doing these uh, attacks? And uh... I do not have a lot of comfort that the Chinese are going to do do right by us in terms of intellectual property, and so it really is up to us as Americans to protect our intellectual property against people that would steal it. Uh, and so I think that really we're going to have to build up build good walls. Uh, and one thing I'll say that you know that I'm hearing from cybersecurity experts is not just you know are we going to be attacked are we going to have systems go down but how do we recover from having them go down and so so there is a second stage of that of look we need good defenses but we also need a good recovery if we have if we have something goes wrong what about 
the government side, um, you know, investment into these cyber warfare capability and so forth. How do you see that? Sure. Well, the United States is is investing in that, and I think that's something important to do. Uh, a lot of that, you know, is classified. Uh, but but rest assured, America, we're very aware, and there's there's a lot of discussion, you know, within the federal government of how do we build uh, offensive cyber capabilities because you need to have those in this world. So you're seeing some kind of private government partnership to do this, or how does that work? So you are you are seeing, and I'm going to see this in the cybersecurity subcommittee, you are seeing some efforts to create some collaboration between government and industry, and you're also watching greater industry collaboration. So you're watching some of the bigger cybersecurity companies work together to share data on, hey, wait a minute, our system was attacked with this process. Oh wow, this other system, this other client, you know, four time zones away, they were attacked by that exact same process. And so you're you're watching companies share more data across platforms. Originally they were more siloed uh, in the way they were approaching things, but I think they realize that working together, they're able to provide a greater, faster defense and then also erect walls faster uh, to stop attacks. So let's switch gears a little bit here. And uh, you've actually done some, you know, very important work, I think, in the state legislature around, you know, protecting students from potential predators within the schools. Yeah. So it, I, I served eight years in the Texas legislature before I came here, four in the Texas House and four in the Texas Senate. Uh, and in my time in the state Senate, you know, became aware of and concerned about sexual predators uh, in the form of teachers. Uh, and that's a very rare group of people. Uh, you know, look, most teachers are absolutely terrific, but some of them do take advantage of their position and unfortunately molest the children that they're, you know, put in charge of teaching. Uh, and I worked on a bipartisan basis in the Texas legislature to end uh, giving pensions to those teachers uh, who molest children. And we're literally, you know, we have teachers, that, you know, that we, we believe were actually collecting a pension while they were sitting in their jail cell uh, and wanted to bring an end to that. And we're actually doing research on figuring out, figuring out that's going on here at the federal level as well. Well, let's shift gears one sure. more time, and because you were actually involved in a number of different areas, and right. uh, especially this new entrepreneurship uh, yeah. caucus, which is a you know a big issue. You know, we're seeing uh, kind of record numbers in small business optimism. Mm -hmm. um, how is the entrepreneurship caucus going to help in all this? Sure. Well, the, the Entrepreneur Caucus, caucus is actually a bipartisan caucus. Joe Negussi, a Democrat from Colorado, and I are both the, the co-heads of that caucus. And we're looking at various legislation and talking to different uh, job creators. Small business creates the majority of the new jobs that are created in our country uh, and the new technologies. Uh, there was a time when Amazon uh, was just an idea. Uh, there was a time that uh, you know that even a big company like GE started as a small company. And so all all big, great companies start as little as smaller companies. And so so you want to continue to foster those small companies and the growth uh, in that space. Uh, and my experience in Texas was, you know, if you keep taxes low, keep regulations light, if you keep litigation to a minimum, uh, you and you, you, you will see uh, companies prosper. You'll see them do well. And certainly at the federal level, I think there's some things that we can do here. So let's so let's talk about this. You have gaining this, you're, you're gaining this reputation of uh, uh, someone that likes to work in a bipartisan fashion. Right. Um, you know, given the inordinate focus on the Mueller uh, investigation and then on the report and, um, you know, basically the focus of the Democrats, you're, you're Republican on this and, and these kinds of issues, how is it possible to be, to be uh, bipartisan in this kind of an environment? You know, uh, in my time, my eight years in the state legislature, I passed 81 bills into law. Everyone had bipartisan support. So I had a very strong track record of reaching across the aisle, uh, working towards a consensus solution to a real problem, whether it was uh, uh, helping military voting, whether it was uh, you know, dealing with a tax issue, whether it was uh, reducing regulations, uh, whether it was uh, carrying the governor's ethics package, protecting victims of domestic violence. Again and again and again, there are areas and issues that you can work on where there's bipartisan support. Now it takes time, it takes work, it takes effort. You have to build relationships to achieve those kinds of changes. And that's certainly something I've been, I, when I ran for Congress, I told my voters, I'm gonna work on a bipartisan basis to try to get things done. I'm a conservative, I'm a Republican, Make no mistake about that, but but just because you're a Republican and a conservative doesn't mean you can't support your own principles and go get things done that are going to help the American people. 
Well, this is a fantastic place to end, actually, a, a powerful message. And also, you know, I wish you the best of success in that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Great to be with you.